what exactly is design management and should you build a career in this field? That's exactly what we're going to answer in this episode of the Zista podcast. Welcome to the Zista podcast, where we invite industry professionals and academicians to answer queries that students have. So one query that we came across is, what's the right way to scale design operations and systems to meet the needs of a growing business? And joining me today, I have Professor John Denon. He's the Chair for Design Management and Service Design at SCAD, one of the best art and design schools in the US and arguably around the world. Let me tell you a little bit about John. He's completed his BFA and MFA in Industrial Design, and he's worked with some leading manufacturers in consumer products, food, and pharma companies. So his accomplishments cover design innovation, brand building, and organization transformation on a global and regional basis. I'm delighted you're joining me today, John. Thank you so much for making time for this session. Oh, no problem at all. It's a pleasure to be with you. Fantastic. So let's jump straight into uh, the topic that we have in terms of how do you scale design operations and systems? And I thought maybe we'd start with a very basic question. What exactly is design management? That's a great question. A lot of people ask me it. And to me, a lot of the simplicity of design management is about setting up conditions where you can use creativity within your organization, whether it's for profit or not for profit. Uh, to make a di difference and um, hopefully help the business grow. So does, and when I think about what conditions means, that's really about how do we operate as a group of creatives? How do we get the best out of them and help the business grow in the most effective way? Okay, so that, that makes sense. And uh, then it leads me to the next question as to how do you get into design management and what are some of the key areas that are impacted by design management? There's, well, there are lots of different pathways into design management. Um, at SCAD, we're lucky because we have a course that's specifically focused on that. Um, but in history, a lot of people have come into design management through different pathways. Right. Um, I, I'm one of those people. I started as an industrial designer yeah. and I went to for a pharma company. And um, initially, I was employed just to do industrial design work. But after a while, you could see the opportunity to broaden creativity's impact. So I took over graphics from a creative to a production point of view. Right. So that was a way for me to not only have broader impact within an organization, but also bring design to life in a more impactful way. So rather than it being um, either outsourced or somebody who was sort of, I'm going to call it, quote unquote, in the back room, it all of a sudden brought it into the front room and you could actually start to uh, influence the direction of an organization. Right. Yes. So uh, the, you know, the impact of it is fairly significant as you, as you can um, sort of build out and then that'll depend on what your organization needs. But the pathway into it for me was through industrial design and then through um, seeing the opportunity to impact and then making my um, my skills and my capability more agile to not, un not only understand, but also have a creative point of view on it. Fantastic. So let me ask you this, John, uh, where does design management operate? And uh, do you see the discipline change? Maybe you could tell me something about that. Uh, yeah, I'll, there are two parts to that question. So the shop, then we start with the where do, where do we operate? Um, so typically, uh, it's a little bit organization dependent, um, but you can see design or design management having a role not only in terms of innovation, but all the way it's an end-to-end -end service, or it should be an end-to-end -end service. Right. Um, you have to have great innovation. You have to make the innovation work for your brands or your services. Right. And you have to execute it. So um, really, you know, one of the great sayings I always remember is um, the consumer only sees your execution. They don't see all the great strategy work. They don't see all the development. They see the end of that. 
So whilst you do all those uh, innovation and uh, brand steps, you also need to remember that you're going to ultimately execute something that people hopefully grow to love. Awesome. Awesome. That makes sense. And I think, uh, you know, it's a more very formalized way to approach it, you know, from an end-to-end -end point of view, as you said, from the creative strategy all the way to the production. So that was really interesting uh, that you mentioned that, uh, John. Um, tell me about the courses at SCAD, you know, what are SCAD students doing and what are some of the key trends uh, that are on their mind? Well, so um, I'll give you a little bit of a broad overview of Sean. Sure. sure. We have um, over 43 uh, disciplines with, I've lost count of exactly how many courses, but it's well over 100. Um, and it covers just about every creative outlet that you could ever need for communicating on a brand and beyond. Uh, but I'm in the School of Business Innovation, right. um, which is sort of very closely aligned to the school of design and part of that is um, twofold one is to make sure that we're we're building the right um, business aspect into design or design management and service design those kinds of courses because they're influential in terms of where a brand and a company or an organization can go once you understand what you're going to do, whatever that is on a brand, then you can start to work with um, the School of Design, some of the other schools within the organization to get the creativity to come to life. Sure. So you start off with that sort of strategic overview, and then you can start to sort of uh, go down into what are the avenues of creativity we need. So... Um, you know, when I look across the industry in the sort of time frame that I've been involved with it, um, first of all, it was about um, getting design to the table. And at that particular point, it was very, I'm going to call it a mix of graphic design, industrial design, product design, those kinds of disciplines that led the way. As we've experienced much more digital transformation, you're starting to see other kinds of capabilities come in and as you get into you know the barriers to going to market for small medium-sized brands are much less than they used to be so you can start to communicate in a vast diversity of different ways which then brings to life more communication discipline so then you get into the school of digital media and it really explodes in terms of here are tools, technologies, capabilities that you can use to communicate. And in some respects, it becomes much more complex because you've got more to choose from. Um, but the positive side of that is um, you have more opportunities then to get your message to your target audience. Absolutely. And that's so important. Um, you know, and I'm so happy that, uh, you know, you have design coming to the forefront. Uh, I remember reading a very interesting book which said that uh, the true competitive advantage today is going to be led by design. Because as we see it, products and services are getting increasingly similar in terms of their attributes, in terms of the core offering. So it's the design of that product or that service, that experience, that will be the true differentiator for organizations. So I, I really resonate with what you're saying, uh, John. Yeah. Uh, so... Coming to the design management pra uh, practice, what do you see are some of the key aspects? Look, um, from a, um, a personal point of view, uh, or an individual point of view, better said, um, you have to have a mix of a couple of different skills. Um, the, it, you have to understand um, the management process within the organization you're working in. And how you go from I've got an idea or we've got an idea to how that actually makes itself to market. The other piece that's increasingly now uh, more relevant has been for quite a few years is you have to bring a practitioner skill with you. Right. So whether that's digital design, industrial design, it really doesn't matter as long as it's relevant to the process you're or the organization you're working with. So I think those are two things that you need to think about. If you're a leader in an organization, um, 
and you're trying to scale up, you know, one of the one of the first things that comes to mind is what really is the work? And I would say, what's the work of today? Plus, what does the work look like in three to five years time? Because uh, in some corporations, what you work on today may not get to market until three or five years time. So you have to start thinking ahead and planning ahead um, and be cognizant of that. Um, going back to that sort of scale up point of view, there are sort of four values that I um, hold from a leadership point of view that are pretty critical. Um, the first one in is um, who's the talent? Um, so you have to have talent, whether you're creating an internal organization or an external organization. You need to work with talent that's going to meet uh, and hopefully exceed your business needs. Um, the second point is about process. And most people think in the creative space about processes, almost become a dirty word. Um, but if you think about it in a more sort of positive way, if you can create a process that's efficient, effective, helps decision making quickly, um, is successful and repeatable, then you've got an opportunity then to influence how an organization does something effectively. And the last one, um, and this is these four points are not in order of priority. Um, so that you, you have to sort of flex with them a little bit. The last one is about, uh, environment. So environment is not just a physical thing, but it's also a psychological thing. So the physical piece could be how you bring different teams together and um, does the space that you're working in inspire and functionally help you deliver. The other part about environment is how does leadership, whether it's you, whether it's the C-suite or whatever management organization you're working with, how do they support your activities? So if I think of some of my personal examples um, where design has been successful or where I've flourished is, uh, um, is where I've worked in an environment that's been incredibly supportive. Um, I can think of times at PNG where we're working in an environment where, um, we had a transition of management and the transition led to somebody who was much more, um, immersed in what we were doing, much more supportive of what we were doing. And it made the process then of, um, whether it was agreeing the innovation all the way through to finalizing the design, it made the process a lot easier because you felt supported and it felt like your point of view had value. You still had to do the hard work to develop the point of view and get the, the work created, but it was, it felt easier, uh, for me, certainly as a leader. And for my team to deliver against that, because we knew we had somebody who had our back. So the environment to me is a critically important piece. I, I know I left it to sort of last on the list, so to speak. Um, but once you have an environment, you know, a positive, supportive environment in place, the talent will come, the processes will be easier and it'll, able, it'll enable you to manage more effectively and ultimately lead more effectively and make more dramatic change for your business or your organization. Thanks, John. Can you give me an example of a, a case study of successful design management in an organization? Uh, I, I'll give you a couple actually. Sure. Um, so one from my personal history and, um, one that I've observed, uh, so the one from my personal history is, uh, the time that I spent at PNG. And, um, uh, when I started at BMG, uh, was in the UK and I was working on the, um, what we called at the time, the Middle East, Africa and general export business. And, um, the, the hiring manager, um, took a gamble and the gamble was, I'm going to bring in a design person. We don't have a design person today, or we don't have a design organization in the organization in London. So we're going to bring somebody in, we'll put them in R and D. And then when the time is right, we'll move them into design. When that happened, which was, uh, I would say, you know, this is going to feel like ancient history in the mid nineties now, uh, 
there was me and one other guy dealing with the whole of Europe, um, Africa and the Middle East. And when I looked at the global organization at that stage, there was, you know, maybe 40 people, maybe 50 max all over the world for what was, you know, what at the time was at least either number one or the number two CPG organization globally. Within 10 years, we'd gone from that sort of 40 to close to 350 people. Um, and it was a dramatic expansion um, of design as a capability. It became a function in its own right. And we, we divided, we had a central organization that sort of created strategy and governments for the overarching piece of design. And then we, we had um, teams in every business unit. Um, I was in a, a beauty care business unit for the longest period of time. And I led a couple of different parts of that. So to me, we went from, um, you know, being a very, very small, extremely fragmented department globally to one of significance. In fact, actually at one point, um, there was a, there was a finance com conversation that said, you know, now we have to look at design because it started <laughs> to be a big enough spend where it makes a difference to the organization. So to go from, I would say, not quite complete obscurity, but not far off, to then becoming a line item on a company like that, their budget, then that was a significant change. The other thing I think was great about that, outside of the financial piece, uh, is the fact that we're able to not only start to get recognition externally, um, by winning competitions, having success in business, we were able to get recognition internally. Um, you know, for the most part, that was incredibly positive because you could start to see not only um, you were able to get to the management table, but you were able to stay there as well. And a lot of people will say, well, it's really hard to get to the management table, and, and it certainly isn't the easiest thing. But once you do get there and you find a way to be part of that, then the value and the impact you have as a designer, as a creative within a large organization is incredibly satisfying. And, you know, when you think about a company like that, the impact of design in terms of everyday consumers' lives is, is you know, extremely huge. So that's one example. We went from obscurity to a high degree of success, um, and that actually um, turned the path of our business around. The second one, which is um, interesting um, in a similar way, and I'm, I'm not super, I'm not nearly as close to it as I was with PNG, um, and looking looking at the fortunes of um, how a company like Logitech is progressing. And um, they have a very forward-thinking CEO, and he is very inclusive of design in terms of um, how he brings them to the table. So he has a strong design leader um, there. And one of the things I find so compelling outside of what they put on the shelf every day is they're starting to use design to reshape the future of their company. And so that to me is really powerful because when I think of the maturity continuum of design and design management, then once you start to influence the strategic direction of a company, then you know you you really are having a big impact with how you use design and creativity to make a difference to business. So it gets very much to the start of this question around the future of a lot of experiences are going to be very much <clears throat> design driven. All right. So I, I have just one one more question I'd like to ask you. You know, um, in the context of larger organizations, there's this concept of entrepreneurship. But what really is the difference between entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship? And what do you see as uh, some of the challenges that we might face in the future? Sure. So I think of entrepreneurship as around you know, creating a product or a service that is um, either a spin or something new. Um, and that to me could be 
a startup all the way through to how a big organization does something. Entrepreneurship is something that's much more focused on design management or the, um, the skill of design management. And that is, again, that sort of end-to-end -end thinking around how do you start to strategically impact the pathway of a company, however uh, big or small it is, in terms of how you bring creativity to the table, how you leverage that creativity to make a difference. And uh, in many respects, it leads back to um, two of the values that I talked about earlier on, which is process and talent. Um, the process piece of it is how, how do you get that strategic intent built in? The talent piece, is, piece of it is how do you bring not only the right talent in to lead it, but how do they influence the, um, the peers, the cross-functional partners to start to think about their roles differently? So as I think about, in particular, the PNG example that I shared with you, um, I was at a leadership team with all the cross-functional leaders. And so um, I, I knew I had support from the president of the business, and he wanted to you know, make a statement with design. So to do that, we had to think about how we worked differently, from supply chain to R&D to procurement, to sales uh, across the board, marketing as well. And so then you have the opportunity or the forum um, then to start to influence and get um, people strategically aligned to how do you move design forward. And what that opens the door for when you um, are successful at it is bringing in more creative capability, regardless of what the discipline is as you open up the opportunity to influence people's receptivity to creativity then the net effect of that is you'll have more of it on your brand and it um, will hopefully make a positive difference so just remind me of the second part of the question again about uh, challenges for the future you know challenges for the future um well i think that shows up in many different ways um I think you know at a um, at a mega scale, things like DEI, sustainability, all those you know globalization. How is that evolving? Those are the mega trends that are going to impact. At a more macro design management level, to me, I want to go back to how do I um, become more discipline agnostic? And what I mean by that is how do I become because the landscape of creativity is so much broader. How do I become um, not only more open to, but more understanding of what different disciplines can uh, can bring to the creative eye? Which I think is one of, to me, is a competitive advantage of SCAD because you can see across the entirety of the platform of creativity. And uh, the, ch the challenge with that is it's a lot and you have to you have to have uh, enough expertise to be dangerous so to speak so how do you start to you know use that you have to become more agile much more flexible um on a much broader scale of impact so um those are all challenges for the future um at a macro and a micro level that design managers um, or design leaders are going to have to cope with. Thank you. Thank you. I think you detailed that well. And, uh, you know, just to kind of say, uh, no matter what challenge comes up, uh, whether it's macro or micro, when it comes to the creative field, when you have creative people, I'm sure they'll find creative solutions. I'm sorry if that sounded kind of cliche, but <laughs> I, I feel that, uh, you know, creative people will figure a way out and uh, creativity shines. And I think... Um, Design is such an important aspect today of our lives. We may not pay attention to it, but so many times the brands we choose, the products we use, the services we consume, it's the ones that are designed well, you know, from a consumption and experiential perspective that really determines our preferences. You know, it, it impacts our preferences. And uh, I think it, as I said, you know, it's the true competitive advantage that brands can actually create today. 
So thanks, John. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this session. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you know, we're going to keep creating content like this and we're going to request Professor John to come back once again for another episode where we're going to discuss a little bit more on service design. Um, you can certainly catch the audio version of this podcast on Google, Spotify and Apple. Till we meet again, I'd say stay curious. <laughs>